Well, good evening and good morning to uh, all our attendants. Uh, my name is Khaled Alak. I'm a neurosurgery chief resident at the American University of Beirut, and I'm a trainee in the Ian's uh, training cycle. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome our esteemed panelists today and to welcome every one of you who are attending from, from Europe, from, from the Middle East, uh, and from the US. Uh, we're starting with 88 participants, with 100 participants already, uh, along with uh, many more people on uh, the Ian's social media platforms. Uh, we meet here today to discuss a topic that's important for all of us, the sagittal alignment uh, of the spine. Um, well, recently in uh, the Dura podcast, the newly established Ian podcast, uh, the Ian's ch ch president, Dr. Carl Charl, uh, Dr. Carl Charl said that he wishes to see Ian's as a platform for the entire neurosurgery community where people can meet and share ideas. We're honored today to be part of, of that vision. Uh, my thanks to the Ian's uh, the office, uh, for Ms. Anarek, uh, for the Ian's president, and for Professor Duff, the, uh, the head of the Ian's spine section, uh, all of which were instrumental for this webinar to happen today. And uh, my thanks to everyone of the panelists, uh, which I'm gonna hand the screen over to uh, my professor, my mentor, Dr. Ghassan Skaff, uh, to welcome the panelists and to start the discussion. Uh, Dr. Skaff, uh, the screen is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, it is uh, my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this uh, webinar on Sagittal Alignment of the Spine, organized jointly by the Division of Neurosurgery at the American University of Beirut in collaboration with the European Association of Neurosurgical Societies, (EANS). First of all, allow me to warmly welcome Professor uh, Cedric Barre and AUB alumnus, uh, Dr. Wasim Basiri from Hospices Civil de Lyon, France, and Dr. Jens Chapman uh, uh, and Dr. Robert Hart and AUB alumnus, Dr. Lies Lies from Seattle Science, Science Foundation uh, in Washington in the US. It is uh, my great honor and pleasure to welcome Professor uh, Jean Dubousset, who will uh, honor us with his presence at, uh, as the webinar's uh, special uh, guest. I also would like to welcome Dr. Khalid uh, Alok, our chief resident, who is going to moderate this session. And thank you, Khalid, for a great job you have done. Uh, restoration of the spine's sagittal profile has been recognized as an important objective in adult deformity surgery. Early studies have focused mainly on achieving sagittal spinal balance, as you all know, as determined by the sagittal vertical axis, SVA, and the relationship between lumbar lordosis and pelvic incidence. These concepts are still actively evolving, but remain good, guide, good uh, guide, uh, guidelines, which govern the basis of adult deformity surgery of the thoracic and lumbar spine, uh, and the lumbar spine. As professor of neurosurgery at the American University of Beirut, interested in, in surgery, I'm much concerned to share knowledge and experience about sagittal alignment of the spine. It seems to me to launch this topic which could be treated in a transversal way throughout this webinar. I'm particularly happy to host this webinar today and to exchange views and share experiences with other high-level professors, colleagues, and friends representing well-known university hospitals. I congratulate you for your commitment and active 
participation in this significant and prestigious event. And I would like to tell you that a record version of this webinar will be available. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Scaff. And like Dr. Scaff alluded, uh, this meeting is being recorded and to, the recording will be available on uh, Ian's Academy website. Uh, I also would like uh, to share with you before we start the agenda we've prepared for this meeting. Uh, so we're gonna go. Uh, so we have a meeting that is scheduled to run for 90 minutes. Uh, the, the speakers will go in turn and uh, we will keep the discussion and the questions, which uh, please feel free to type in and, and share in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll keep these questions uh, to the end of the uh, discussion. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Jens Chapman. Uh, Professor Chapman is uh, beyond introduction since he started his medical career from the University of Munich. Uh, he has over three decades of uh, training and graduating generations in uh, spine surgery. Uh, many of you follow his uh, articles and his uh, events on the social media of Seattle Science Foundation uh, uh, platforms. Uh, Dr. Chapman is presenting a topic uh, titled Approaches to Spine Balance, Geometric, Dynamic, and the Gestalt. Dr. Chapman, the screen is yours. Thank you, Dr. Alok, and uh, thank you to our great colleagues in Beirut, and uh, cordial welcome to our colleagues in France. Uh, it's a great honor to be allowed to speak here, and it's uh, spoken with the greatest of appreciation for your medical culture and accomplishments. And it's customary to start these lectures with a conflict of interest disclaimer, and let me just tell you, I'm heavily conflicted about Professor Dubusset. I love the man, he is my hero, and whatever I know, I owe to him. So I'm completely conflicted. Um, I hopefully will stay within 15 minutes and just basically talk about a bigger picture than angles and lines relative to the spine. And let me tell you, I'm a proud spine surgeon. I know that we can positively change lives. It's a huge burden of disease to walk around like this person in the 14th century that I saw in a, uh, in a, uh, a display in Holland. Uh, you can't even think about how this person lived, but it's amazing to see that this person probably got uh, into her 50s. And yes, this is just a routine picture of an uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. These are amazing breakthroughs that have been done. And again, Professor Dubusset and our French colleagues had such an amazing impact in terms of teaching us the techniques and a better understanding. And yes, this is just a quick example of how we can change lives. And yes, we've done them open traditionally, and I'm still an open surgeon, but by cutting the spinal column, we can straighten out the spine and hopefully keep it there. Now that right-hand top box shows a couple of things that are adversely affected uh, by a deformed kyphotic spine, pulmonary, cardiac, digestive, neurologic pain, and depression. So it's a whole cascade that starts somewhere in the trunk and finally ends up in the brain and then goes back down the body again. And I am not going to talk about angles and lines here. All of you have plenty of resources, and I'm greatly honored to again have a partner in Dr. Bob Hart, who's one of the senior members of the ISSG. And yes, Bob, senior is a euphemism for getting old. So you and I are both old geezers now. But there's a great resource material. I personally will conjecturize to you that we may have a little bit of a hyper focus on angles and lines and have gone into too schematic of a thought process of how to straighten out a spine uh, in a geometric fashion. And I'm always worried when I encounter dogma. Yes, this comes as a surprise as somebody from Germany, but I'm a little bit worried about dogma. I want uh, to have a bigger picture. One thing I want to also write out, uh, throw out there is I hear more and more talk about not correcting too much in this age group or that. I am really worried about that. We've been there. We've done that. That doesn't work for me. Intelligent rebalancing of the spine, if we then do surgery, is a big deal. And this is, again, my hero, uh, Professor Dubusset, who I got to experience when I was a resident in Texas. And again, the cone of economy goes beyond the cone of economy as a ergonomic statement. It's a psychological statement. It's a, a natural statement in terms of physiology and harmony of nature. Recreating a harmony of the spine as a carrier for our head is, I think, the goal. 
And again, there's so much more that goes into the body habitus. I saw this little diagram on the internet, so I saw I put that up, but I'm not gonna read through this, but there are multiple different variants that come into play as we look at spinal alignment that are not done justice by the current angle and line fixation. And again, this doesn't even start to address the body habitus, which in our country veers towards the right side or the muscular self-dedication of patients. So these variables are a big deal. And again, in our spine fixation, we do need to start from the base. That's my one thing to my neurosurgical colleagues, start with the feet, the ankles, the knees, and the hips, and go up from there. Again, dogma is a problem. And again, uh, whenever we kind of just have a simple uh, ascription to something, uh, that's a problem. And as we face deformity patients, an increasing numbers are asked to deal with harder and more difficult and uh, sick patients. We really need to think about how do we do, uh, how do we approach them? Do we do nothing? Uh, is there some intelligent non-surgical way that does not turn them into opiate addicts? Or should we have a rigid spinal column as the ultimate ratio? And again, when we do spine surgery, there are certain areas that are really well regarded. Uh, there are others which are heavily scrutinized. And the expensive big time procedures are very much under scrutiny, not just in our country, in terms of the so-called value proposition. So what's the benefit versus the cost? And this is something that, again, the ISSG and now increasing the AO has done a great job of trying to understand and quantify better, but we don't have that yet. But a major spine surgery in the U.S. is somewhere between 40 to 200,000 U.S. dollars. And again, uh, there's a significant outlier when we have major complications, which easily are $50,000, but can be much, much higher. That's from Joseph Cheng's famous article from 2014. And this is where I want to make my first point. Do we really understand what complications are? I'm not going to ask you to read two slides, but just on the top right, this is done from the SRS in a summary statement. Complications in major deformity surgery were estimated to be roughly about 30 to 50 percent. There are other papers that basically came in with lower numbers, 20 something percent. That was a large uh, number of people who said that. And when we did a, a, a longer term assessment, uh, first of all, at WashU, they basically identified 12 to 20% again. When we looked at it at UW, we came up with 40%. And this was a pretty well done study methodologically, where we had problems like you see a, dis a disengaged rod. Uh, we identified over 40% of complications, uh, significant complications. And of course, you can say we're inept surgeons. But uh, these are, again, things that then were restudied. And this is the first study I want to really present here in greater depth by our Vancouver colleagues. They're literally brothers of ours. We exchange a lot of information with them. They're just north of the border here. And they did a very major, well-performed study to actually capture complications and major spine surgeries. This is an award-winning paper. And again, these are the, the kind of general major papers that identified larger uh, spine surgery complication rates. And the Vancouver friends, and this is usually something I do as a question, but this is not possible in this format, they basically identified the complications. And if I asked Elias, our wonderful Beirut representative here, which category did the Vancouver colleagues in this well control city identify? What number would you give me? He said three, so 26 to 50 percent. Drum roll, the actual complication rate was 87 percent. These are excellent surgeons. It's a very well run center. These are not schlocks, these are very good doctors. So how can this be? Basically, this is the first time that somebody actually prospectively tracked all patients and had well-defined criteria. So it's actually better than our Washington study. So basically, um, the main problem is that complications have been underreported through a variety of methodological problems. Major surgeries can have major complications, and we need to differentiate them intelligently and honestly in terms of preventable and just matter-of-fact ones. And uh, that's the main thing. So education, host optimization are the two opportunities where we can make a big difference. And managing risk is a very big thing. We call it a transactional approach. We basically try to have a very fair and balanced uh, kind of a discussion as to what are the pros and what are the cons. And all too often, I find ourselves as kind of being like salesmen who try to uh, sell you a, a, a bad car. I'm not going to mention any manufacturers as a German here, but uh, basically this is, uh, this is just a common problem that we oversell. We're supposed to be a, a, a source of wisdom and thought as we interact with our patients. And this is where I want to make point number two. The focus should always be the patient. Who is this actually beyond the angles that we see? What's going on in their mind, in their heart, in their psychosocial setting? 
And this is what Elias challenged me to talk about. This is a German word, but it's become very commonly used in the US language. It's called the Gestalt, the bigger picture appearance of a patient. So beyond angles and lines, understanding the Gestalt of a patient. Because there's so much that goes into a patient who stands forward something like this. And let's start with the head. Depression, uh, severe kind of a maladjustment to the environment, lack of nutrition, lack of activities, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. Understanding this big picture as a framework of the patient mandates that we don't just measure angles with our wonderful ER system, thanks to Professor Dubisset, uh, but we have to literally act like psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and do a very good exam on patients. So understanding our patients, getting to know them beyond just making a snap judgment for surgery is a really big deal. So examining them personally, physically examining, again, starting with their legs, and uh, assessing flexible or fixed curves. I, for instance, find the recumbent test way underutilized. Can a patient, when they're laying flat, still breathe easily? Does their spine roll out straight or does it stay crooked? Those are big differences. How are their knees? How are their hips? This leads me to point three, prehab. So our former partner, Dr. David Hanscom, was one of the pioneers in the US over 20 years ago to make sure that patients uh, uh, get really identified in their own identities, that we have research-based advancements, education uh, of applications, health status-related activities as goal, and better outcomes. So five simple things that we're nowadays really trying to do, and we're not always good at it, but if we do error analyses, it's usually a deviation of one or more of these factors. Detoxify our patients from opiates and uh, sedatives, weight and nutritional optimization, protein up, weight down, glycemic control. Nicotine cessation is a big deal. We're about to come out with a very major study through one of our wonderful fellows, and uh, it is actually worse than what we thought. And this is a very large global study that we did. Psychosocial wellness and cardiopulmonary fitness, the recumbent bike as an example. So we have to look for details in a far more comprehensive fashion than ever before, bone quality, understanding connective tissues, understanding neuropathies and posterior column diseases and neuromuscular diseases way better than we've done before. And identifying the adverse effects of some medications like steroids, anti-TNF medications and non-steroidals. Prehab, again, understanding bone posture and balance and educating our patients beforehand so that we don't give them a rigid a device into the back that they then just fall like an interior internal hanging from is a really big deal. So this re-education is a physiatry, a rehab thing that we as spine surgeons should control and not just delegates to PTs, that means physiotherapists or rehab doctors. Fourth point is risk management. So identified that risks are far more common than done. This is an older <clears throat> 2012 technology that we developed at UW at the University of Washington, my time there. And this is still publicly available. There's no tracking. Tracking. It's called Spine Sage. I still like this because it was actually done on over 4,000 patients, and the variables are 21. You can access it simply online at University of Washington Spine Sage. We have an invasiveness level that's kind of uh, scientifically proven, and again, we've mount, uh, in the in that era did it on open surgeries. Basically, we did not have MISS or XLIFT type far lateral techniques available then, but uh, with that caveat in mind, we can identify with a pretty high accuracy what the overall complication range is, and infection risk, and uh, general outcomes. So this is something that I have used commonly to kind of quantify visually to my patients what it means to do these bigger surgeries, and it helps. And interestingly, most patients accept the risks. Maybe that's because we as human beings have a very poor risk-taking quantification. But raising awareness helps us all because quality organizations, insurance companies, hospitals, hopefully will have a better respect and understanding for what we're doing. Now, my fourth point is gonna be the following. It's very hard for us to look into the minds of patients. If I just run through these two patients, patient A, pretty big, old, never treated idiopathic scoliosis, pain all over, this is almost the same scoliosis, maybe even a little bit worse, neurologically intact, 61-year-old female, pain all over, neurologic exam like and the predecessor, uh, uh, pretty much normal. Which patient would need surgery? I'll ask Elias again and then tell everybody, which patient, A or B, will need surgery, wants to have surgery? Assuming only one ha has surgery. He says B will need surgery. Bob, A or B? 
I'm looking at the uh, at the sagittal and I think uh, A is out of sagittal alignment and therefore that's the one that's going to be. So A, doc, we have a disagreement. It's fantastic as a sample. Two surgeons, one says A, the other one will say B. Patient A got a long fusion. Uh, I did not do a perfect job with sagittal reconstruction. She is an extremely happy long-term patient. She's now 68, actually, I have to say. She's become a donor. She is, uh, has given a large, large, generous donation to us uh, and continues to be a sponsor for us. She's very happy with the surgery. And these are her outcome studies, her patient-reported outcomes, and they showed a very favorable response. Now let's look at the other patients. This is actually a, a pixelated study. After, I think I know her now for six years or so, she remains very reasonably happy. If I look at her scores, they are literally no different from the surgically treated patient. Something is going on in her mind that lets her continue to be relatively happy with her study. Maybe she's from Iowa, like the place where Dr. Hart trained. She's actually a French-American lady, so maybe it's red wine or the French uh, 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 vivre, the, the joy of life. We don't know. But basically, doing these surgeries is a big deal. Things that if we do surgery post operatively drive me nuts. I just want to expand on that, are having done a major surgery and seeing patients propped up in their beds putting a fulcrum on the upper instrumentation, pulling patients up from their arms, having patients walk with a walker forward bent like a shopping cart, and having a generally poor posture. So those are things that we have to avoid. And again, this is just one of my failures. We did a multi-level interdiscal osteotomy on this patient. She was thrilled for about four years, and we did a nice junctional preservation surgery. And lo and behold, she fell apart. She had some Parkinson's. We expanded her. And this brings me again to mobilization. We need to be better physiatrists. We need to have really better lookouts in terms of how to mobilize patients with sticks, for instance, prone position exercises, et cetera. This is a patient that I revised, and she was actually very happy after her T3 to pelvis fusion. So these are possible. So major surgery is a major undertaking. We need to really uh, report our complications more honestly and have a more shared decision-making. That means partnership with the patients and their families. Uh, we need to basically probably do a better job at prehabbing and being the uh, rehab doctors that are enlightened. And we need to track our progress through registries. That's the main thing. The burden of disease uh, of spine is fundamental, but getting to the gestalt of patients is, I think, the key towards better results. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chapman, for kicking off this discussion with uh, such a gestalt uh, introduction. Uh, I'd like to remind our uh, audience, which are uh, kicking on 160 now, I'd, I would like to remind you that you can leave any questions you have in the Q&A box. We will be happy to, be, to go over them at the end of uh, uh, the panel discussion. And now uh, I introduce our second speaker, uh, Professor Cedric Barry. Uh, Professor Barry is one of the leaders uh, of uh, spine surgery in uh, Lyon in France. And uh, he's also uh, one of, of the leader authors uh, on the topic of uh, sagittal alignment. Uh, Professor Barry, thank you for being here. And uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, Khaled. Thank you so much. Um, can, you, can you see the, the presentation? Yes, yes, Dr. We can. Okay, the, the video and sound is OK. OK. So good day, everyone. So it's, it's my great pleasure and honor to uh, to share this webinar with my uh, colleagues from Beirut, from Seattle, and uh, of course with uh, our special guest speaker, Professor Jean Dubousset. So my lecture will focus on uh, spinal osteotomies. So the objective of spinal osteotomies is to treat spinal deformity, repositioning the spine into the most economical and physiological situation regarding the sagittal balance. So typically, spinal osteotomies are separate into three main categories. The closing posterior osteotomies corresponding to chevron, the pedicle subtraction osteotomy, PSO, and techniques of vertebral resection, DCR. Spinal osteotomies address rigid spinal deformities, and the advantage is that the correction could be achieved from posterior quasi-exclusively. So in uh, 2014, Frank Schwab reported a classification into six grades according to the amount of bone resection from grade one, corresponding to partial facet resection, 
to grade six corresponding to multi-level vertebral body and disc resection. So grade one and two uh, correspond to a partial and total facet resection. In fact, these osteotomies are always uh, indicated to treat spinal deformities, permitted to uh, release the spine and to enhance intervertebral fusion. Mean correction uh, per level is around five to 10 degrees. Variants are represented by Smith-Peterson and Ponte osteotomies in the thoracic spine. And ideal candidates are patients with uh, long and harmonious curves like the show hormone disease in a young adult. Grade three and four osteotomy um, consist of tricolon osteotomies and uh, correspond to pedicle subtraction osteotomy, more or less completed by adjacent disc resection. So the principle is to resect uh, with a V-shape the uh, vertebral body through the pedicle with the hinge uh, located anteriorly, close to the anterior cortex. The, everything is done posteriorly and mean correction is around 25 to 35 degrees. So this is an example of lumbar degenerative kyphosis treated by PSO permitted to uh, rebalance the patient and reposition the C7 prep line above the sacral plateau. In some cases, you need more correction and visceral may be indicated. The concept is to remove everything. So you remove the posterior element, the vertebral body, the adjacent disc. Mean correction is around 30 to 45 degrees, even more in some cases. And typical indication is sharp and rigid angular deformity like this congenital uh, kyphosis treated by visceral at the thoracolumbar junction. So this is another example of visceral to treat a severe kyphosis uh, consecutive to uh, an infectious process. And you may observe that the angular correction was nearly 50 degrees. And this is another example of visceral performed at the thoracolumbar junction to treat a PGK so permitted to uh, correct the kyphosis and support the anterior colon in only one stage. The one point important to keep in mind is the differences in terms of corrective mechanism. As you can see on the figure, the uh, pivot for correction, the center of correction for chevron is close to the posterior cortex. It is close to the anterior cortex for the pedicle subtraction osteotomy, and it is uh, placed at the center of the vertebral body for visceral. So uh, if we compare visceral and PSO, visceral results into less shortening of the posterior colon, but a greater power of correction. So let's see now some uh, technical points. Uh, more, more precisely. So first, um, grade two osteotomy, so chevron osteotomy. The concept is to perform a V-shaped resection of the posterior element, including a large resection of posterior facet, but with, without complete laminectomy, so with preservation of the lamina and associated with a compression posterior. So the correction is obtained by the combination of a posterior compression and a slight amount of anterior destruction. So this technique necessitates some residual mobility in the anterior colon, and it is not really indicated where the discs are completely fused, and the technique is typically achieved at a several number of levels. So this is an intraoperative view, and you can observe that uh, there is no more bone contact between the two adjacent vertebra from one foramen to another. And we consider that uh, approximately one degree, uh, one millimeter, sorry, of bone correction, of bone resection provides around one degree of angular correction. 
So now, uh, regarding pedicle subtraction osteotomy, some technical points. So I prefer to start laterally and go into the canal in the second step. Regarding the posterior element, so resection of the inferior and superior facet are mandatory, but I try to uh, preserve a part of the lamina, not to resect completely the lamina, which permit to get bone-to-bone -bone contact at the end of the, of the surgery. The pedicle are resected using osteotome. The posterior wall uh, on the midline is uh, resected using uh, keresone wronger. I, I find it very uh, relevant. And laterally, the residual lateral wall is uh, resected using a tucker. A, a, a challenge uh, for pedicle subtraction osteotomy is to achieve the angular correction you have planned to achieve. Uh, in fact, the uh, angular correction is proportional to the base of the osteotomy triangle. So applying pure trigonometry rules, you may anticipate the amount of bone you need to resect to achieve the, the correction you want to, uh, to achieve. So this is pure trigonometry. And there is a really a relevant body landmark during the surgery uh, to help you to, to achieve this goal. And typically we consider that if you remove just the pedicle, you will have around 20, 25 degrees of angular correction. If you need 25 to 30 degrees additional four or five millimeters below the pedicle is necessary. And if you need 30, 35 degrees of correction, you need to go for transdiscal type. So these are general rules. Um, another point is the uh, importance of promoting bone fusion. So one of the most frequent complications is pseudarthrosis and road breakage. And um, one point is to uh, enhance uh, bone grafting. So that's why uh, preservation of a part of the lamina is uh, essential to my point of view. And as you can see on this figure, intraoperative view, at the end of the surgery, after closure, it's very important to get bone-to-bone -bone contact. So you, uh, you have to find a compromise between adequate decompression of the neurological structures, but leaving enough bone for uh, adequate bone grafting. Ideal candidates for PSO are patients with a complete rigid and fused spine, like this patient, uh, reducing the risk of uh, mechanical complication and pseudarthrosis. Finally, VCR. So the concept of VCR is to remove everything. So you perform a, a complete resection of a vertebral segment, including the posterior element, vertebral body, adjacent disc. You can do it posteriorly, PVCR. You can do it combined approach, PA or AP VCR. Uh, it typically achieved at the apex of the deformity and indicated for sharp angular deformities. So technically, uh, a few points I, I want to uh, share with you. So one, one step is to um, dissect the spine from the soft tissue. So this is important to uh, separate and push away all the, the soft tissue around the spine, as you can see on these figures. Then the main step for VCR are first resection of the posterior element, superior inferior facet lamina resection of the vertebral body according to the uh, deconciliation technique, and finally, reconstruction of the anterior colon using a cage. And during all the procedure, you need to control perfectly the stability of the spine by the means of a temporary road. And this is a very important point, especially at the thoracic spine level. This is an animal model, and you may observe uh, the catastrophic potential consequence for the spinal cord of an inadequate bone resection. So it's very uh, important prior any corrective maneuver to ensure 
a complete uh, decompression of the spinal cord to avoid any uh, neurological injury. The advantage of visceral is that it permits the correction of the deformity and also the reconstruction of the anterior colon during the same surgical procedure, just one stage posteriorly. Uh, this is an example of visceral performed in the lumbar spine to treat uh, uh, post-traumatic kyphosis. So permitted to correct the deformity, rebalance the patient, and reconstruct the anterior colon just in one stage. And this is uh, an example of VCRO performed by combined surgery, so PA VCRO, uh, to treat a severe cervicothoracic kyphosis in the context of ankylosing spondylitis with correction of the deformity from posterior and then uh, reconstruct of the anterior colon from anterior. So this was a, a case by combined surgery. Okay, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barry, for this uh, detailed and comprehensive review of the techniques available to the surgeon to correct uh, the sagittal deformity. We have a couple of questions, but uh, as I said, I'll we'll keep them till the end and we'll address them, uh, all of them together at the end. Uh, now, with this, it's given me a great pleasure and honor to introduce one of the seniors of the International Spine Study Group, Dr. Robert Hart. Uh, Dr. Hart is going to tell us about sagittal alignment and spine surgery failures in his talk. Dr. Hart, the screen is yours. So um, I uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and for the opportunity to speak uh, with such a, a renowned group of uh, surgeons. It really is an honor for me. Um, I have to apologize. I'm going to change the topic uh, from what was listed a bit uh, and maybe change gears here, but it is still a very relevant uh, talk, I think, in terms of, uh, in terms of pay, uh, defining patient expectations and uh, being able to preoperatively inform our deformity patients uh, regarding how this type of surgery will affect them uh, with respect to their uh, mobility or uh, stiffness. So I'm gonna use that as my topic and uh, go through uh, several aspects of this that we've studied uh, both independently and then ultimately within the ISSG over a number of uh, years. Here are my uh, conflicts. Again, none of these I think are relevant to this talk. So I start with this slide and I, I, I like to emphasize this to our residents and to our fellows. Uh, I think as we move through our training and become uh, kind of um, hardened a bit to what it is we're doing in the operating room, uh, we oftentimes I think lose track or lose sight of the fact that uh, the reality is that when we're operating on somebody, we are injuring them. It is a controlled injury. We do it in the best way possible, in the safest way possible. But in the end, we are, uh, we are creating an injury as we operate. Uh, and if you, if you accept that, then you begin to recognize that there are inevitably outcomes from the surgeries that are, uh, are not uh, positive for the patient. And among those, I think it's very easy to imagine, for example, creating a scar. Uh, none of us typically uh, want a scar on our body, but when we finish, when we, the patient heals, they are forever going to have a permanent uh, reminder of what they went through in the form of the healed skin incision. So a collateral outcome is an unavoidable consequence it's not a complication, uh, but it is an adverse outcome. It's adverse in the fact that it has ultimately negative effects for the patient, but it is not, uh, it is not something that is uh, random or only occasional. It's something that is expected and occurs with regularity every time we operate. And as I sort of formulated that idea and the phrasing of a collateral outcome, uh, I uh, discovered that, of course, it's, I'm not the first person to uh, consider that or imagine that. And there's a paper out of Toronto. This was out of the general surgery department. And Steven Strasberg was a, the senior author on this uh, um, and he's a friend of my wife's, actually a full professor now in hepatobiliary surgery at uh, Washington University in Seattle. But uh, he used the phrase sequelae, uh, which 
to him uh, meant the same thing. And, and I think it, it very much does sound like a synonym when you uh, consider the word sequelae versus the notion of a collateral outcome, something that automatically goes with the surgery. And uh, in spine surgery and outcomes research, which we've extended over the last uh, decades, uh, in a very uh, important and positive way uh, in terms of gathering data uh, and uh, developing these questionnaires. These are all validated and repeatable. Um, but I think the focus of these questionnaires has typically been on aspects that we expect to improve with our surgeries. So mostly these are pain. The SRS uh, 22 has some uh, questions regarding deformity itself and the impacts of the deformity. But uh, this is mostly act activity and pain-based outcome scores that are, uh, are things we're seeking to improve. And I would put forward that while pain and function are critical for patients, there may be other issues that affect function and satisfaction following our treatments. And I've experienced, and I think it's uh, true for most of us, when we start to talk to our patients about the notion that we're going to be performing a fusion, uh, taking motion away from their spine, the, the first question out of their mouths is, how will I be able to move? How will it affect me? And, and uh, we really have not had uh, until recently a data-based answer to that question. Uh, and I think, in fact, some post-fusion patients do complain about uh, impacts of stiffness on their function. That was really, for me, what led me to want to develop uh, some sort of a validated questionnaire to provide information to patients uh, and predict who was going to be most affected and, and, uh, and in what way. So now over 10 years ago, uh, uh, at, with my colleagues at uh, Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, we developed a questionnaire called the, we called the Lumbar Stiffness Disability Index. This was made analogous, uh, in an analogous fashion to the Oswestry Disability Index, and that's why we use this sort of a uh, similar name. Uh, similar to the Oswestry, it, it had 10 questions focusing on limitations in activities of daily living, living not due to pain, but due to stiffness through the, the lumbar spine. And here's an example. This is the first question off of the questionnaire, uh, or this is the, um, uh, yeah, the, the first question off the questionnaire, which states, uh, choose the statement that best describes the effect of low back stiffness on your ability to bend your feet to put on your underwear and pants while dressing. And uh, as for the Oswestry Disability Index, we have 10 questions, and each has a range of uh, one to five, uh, with zero to four points uh, scored uh, for each of those. And then we scale up the uh, construct to uh, from 40 total possible points up to 100 uh, by a multiplier. Uh, and here are the, the other domains, putting on shoes and socks driving, uh, personal hygiene, following toileting, uh, bending to pick up an object off the floor, getting in and out of bed, in and out of a low chair, bathing the lower half of your body, in and out of an automobile, and uh, sexual intercourse, again, analogous to Oswestry Disability Index. So uh, the first uh, order of business once we developed this was to validate and, uh, and test its psychometric properties. And uh, we found that uh, it succeeded on all levels. It was very internally consistent, meaning that the 10 questions all traveled together. So if you have a low score on one, uh, you have a low score on others. And if you have a higher score on one question, you tend to have a higher score on others. Uh, the, it is re test, retest reliable. And we developed an external validation measuring the flexion and extension uh, change between active flexion and extension on lateral uh, x-rays uh, and found that patients with uh, demonstrated stiffness uh, radiographically uh, tended to have uh, uh, higher um, LSDI scores. And uh, we also looked at normative data. We uh, tested a population of both um, uh, symptomatic uh, patients and also asymptomatic uh, individuals and found that uh, their baseline scores uh, are much are nearly zero if they don't have spinal disease. And, and here's that data. Uh, you can see here the uh, normative values for patients without spinal disease are near normal even uh, through uh, age 67, uh, whereas patients that undergo surgery demonstrate a much higher level of effective stiffness preoperatively even before surgery. And I think that becomes kind of a critical uh, issue here. And you'll, uh, you'll see the data that 
uh, shows that. Uh, and also, I think it's important to notice stiffness is going to be much more of an effect for our younger patients if we do large fusions because they are less affected than patients in uh, their 50s, 60s, and 70s. And here's some further data out of that study. This just shows that uh, the, that, uh, the patients with adult spinal deformity as compared to patients that are asymptomatic are different actually in most of their baseline numbers. So uh, we know that they're disabled based on SRS subscores, but it turns out they are also disabled based on the LSDI scores as compared to asymptomatic uh, individuals. And if we look at the age effect and stratification, again, we find that the um, the LSDI scores for both uh, both asymptomatic, but also particularly symptomatic uh, adult spinal deformity patients rise with age uh, before we even operate on them. So uh, with that in hand, we performed a couple of different uh, prospective studies. The first one was a single center study of my patients at OHHU. This is a total of 73 patients uh, for whom we were able to get two-year uh, 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 prospective follow-up. Th these patients were fused a number of different levels, so not only spinal deformity patients, but some patients that were fused only for one level uh, or two levels. Again, multiple diagnoses, but all degenerative. It didn't include any trauma or tumor or infection patients. These are all uh, spondylolisthesis, stenosis patients, and um, uh, either small deformity or there are a few degenerative disc disease patients that were fused just for a degenerative disc. And what we found uh, was that their uh, change from baseline when we looked at uh, ODI and PCS scores. Uh, they all demonstrated improvement in those subscales as a mean, uh, but for the LSDI scores, we found that, in fact, uh, even when we were fusing up to five levels or greater, they did not change significantly. Uh, and the only group that did change significantly was the one-level fusion group, and actually this was a positive change. So they, they reported a higher level of stiffness preoperatively uh, than they did postoperatively after a one-level fusion. Again, the effect of pain and, uh, and uh, perhaps lack of utility or utilization of spinal motion uh, being a key factor here. And here are those results displayed graphically. Uh, if we have a one-level fusion, uh, actually the patients improved from baseline in the LSDI. Uh, at, at two levels, they were essentially unchanged, actually a little below baseline. And then these numbers increasing, but uh, not statistically so in this uh, cohort. Uh, meanwhile, if we looked at the change in the PCS scale, they all increased. Uh, and uh, if we look at ODI, they all decreased the ODI numbers. So again, uh, the successful improvement in the goals of pain relief uh, with very limited uh, effects on uh, functional effects from stiffness. Uh, and here are a couple of examples from that uh, study. This was a, a gentleman that we did uh, one level fusion for a mild degenerative spondylolisthesis with stenosis. And uh, you can see he actually improved his LSDI score by over 10 points. Uh, he improved his ODI score by a little more at 14, and he improved his PCS with a 3.4. And you can see how flexible he is even with his one level fusion on the, uh, the post-operative films. And this is a spinal deformity patient from that study, an 81-year-old woman who uh, came in, again, very stiff and very disabled with sagittal imbalance. And her change in LSDI was a, a, a slight increase of five points, meanwhile, decreasing her ODI by over 10 and increasing her PCS by two and a half points. In that study, we also looked at, the, at several questions reflecting patient satisfaction. Uh, we asked, do you consider the low back stiffness to be a significant limitation in daily activities? And we did find that the patients who had uh, fusions did complain of stiffness and recognized that stiffness was an impact in their lives. But knowing what you know now, would you undergo the same procedure over again? Nearly 100%, an average of 96%. And do you consider any low back stiffness resulting from your surgery to be an acceptable trade-off for the improvements in pain and overall function? Again, very high numbers, 91% uh, averaging out of the whole cohort saying, yes, uh, it's an acceptable trade-off. So that gives us, I think, some armament, armament to bring to our patients to explain what they can expect following these surgeries. So after that, uh, and as part of uh, one of the 
the, the first databases that we created in ISSG, we began to uh, include this questionnaire in both our preoperative and postoperative follow-up uh, among uh, several hundred patients. And uh, we were able to look at uh, questions of uh, stopping point and does stopping point matter proximally or distally uh, in terms of the effect on the overall um, satisfaction and stiffness. So this is multi-centered data prospectively collected. Uh, we have uh, age matching of two groups that are fused either to upper thoracic endpoints of T2 to T4 or thoracal lumbar endpoints of T9 to T11. All of these patients were fused to this sacral pelvis, and uh, we measured other HRQOLs as well as LSDI. We also have radiographic measures for these that I'll show, and then we followed them out to two-year follow-up. We found that the, the upper thoracic versus thoracal lumbar patients had similar baseline data, both for ODI and SRS total, as well as uh, PCS, but they also did for the LSDI, and you can see fairly high numbers, 32, 33 points. Uh, so they are, again, experiencing stiffness even before uh, we operate. Uh, when we look at the ultimate uh, two-year outcomes, uh, we find that the, the comparisons, again, between upper thoracic and thoracal lumbar endpoints are very similar. So the stiffness effects reported if we fuse to the upper thoracic region versus thoracal lumbar, no difference. Uh, and similarly, the other HRQOLs, no difference between the upper thoracic and lower thoracic endpoints. I'm sure that there are differences in the deformity here because there's something that drives the decision uh, to fuse the patient to the upper thoracic versus thoracal lumbar spine. Some of that is probably in the eye of the beholder and in the practice pattern of individual surgeons. But uh, absolutely, I'm sure there are some differences in the patient populations uh, and in their deformities, but none of these uh, uh, exhibit any difference in terms of their uh, functional and pain effects. Uh, when we look at the change from baseline, uh, this is uh, even, I, I think, more informative, and this tells us that uh, LSDI, very little change. So we started at 32, we end at 35, essentially a non-significant uh, change, both in terms of the impact for the patient as well as statistically. And similarly for thoracal lumbar, uh, we start at 33, actually a slight decrease of three points, uh, three or four points. And again, no statistical difference and I think no real clinical impact. Uh, on the other hand, Oswestry Disability Index, we're able to decrease it substantially within this group. Our SRS numbers also increased uh, significantly, and the PCS scores, again, similarly uh, increasing from baseline. When we look at MCID in these groups, uh, not all of the patients still are reaching a minimally clinically important difference, uh, but a substantial majority, so over 60%. Again, no difference uh, between upper thoracic or thoracal lumbar endpoints with any of these outcome scores. And when we look at the radiographic parameters, uh, are there differences if, in terms of the alignment? Uh, so does alignment affect uh, perceived stiffness? And we really were unable to find uh, any significant differences. So it didn't matter what their pelvic incidence was. It didn't matter how much we changed their sagittal alignment or their lordosis. None of these uh, had a significant relationship to the ultimate LSDI score. Uh, change in lordosis clearly close, uh, and I don't really have an explanation for that, but I think the overall message here is that the overall uh, pelvic parameters and sagittal alignment do not affect uh, the ultimate uh, perception of stiffness. This is a gentleman of my own that was in that cohort. Uh, he um, was uh, an individual with a very low pelvic incidence. You can see he's relatively well aligned and is not really uh, retroverting his pelvis too much preoperatively. Uh, we did restore significant lordosis, and I think he's been delighted with that outcome uh, over uh, now many years. Um, and, and uh, uh, successfully healed. You can see very little change in his LSDI, but a, a nice decrease in ODI and an increase in his other uh, functional scores. Uh, here's another example of an upper thoracic uh, endpoint from that uh, population uh, and a, a woman with coronal imbalance. Again, sadly, uh, reasonably well aligned preoperatively, so not a lot of change in her sagittal alignment, slight increase in her lordosis, but improvement in her coronal uh, alignment. And again, uh, a modest increase in LSDI, but a much greater decrease in ODI, increase in PCS and SRS scores. We also queried this patient population with the satisfaction score that's part of the SRS questionnaire. 
and tried to look at the uh, correlation between uh, ultimate LSDI scores and satisfaction with the treatment. And again, very little correlation. So the high level of satisfaction, irrespective of how, uh, per how stiffness affects them and how they perceive stiffness as an impact in their lives. So again, I think this gives us some uh, real uh, data that we can take to patients and explain Yes, you're going to be stiff. Yes, you're going to feel uh, some limitations in activities, uh, but it, as a change from your baseline, it's not going to be uh, a night and day difference in, in your lives. And uh, I'll conclude with a couple of final slides. Uh, uh, I've been gratified that uh, this questionnaire has gotten some notice and some adoption uh, in other countries. This is a uh, population, uh, some from the uh, ISSG database, uh, but some from the experience of Heiko Kohler, a, a German surgeon uh, uh, who uh, does use L5 as a stopping point. Most of the patients in the, L in the ISSG database, as I said, do uh, have fusions to the sacrum. Uh, and uh, this is, again, one of my patients where we did a, a, a uh, an extensive sagittal realignment uh, and fused to the sacrum. This is one of Heiko's uh, patients that uh, stopped at L5, and he uh, he um, uh, created a German version of the LSDI, which he gave to his patients, a German language version uh, translated from the English. And uh, this was the ultimate uh, comparison of that cohort. Stopping at L5 does not preserve significant motion and does not ultimately uh, improve or affect uh, the perceived stiffness, uh, at least in this cohort, a relatively modest size. And this was done uh, retrospectively, not prospectively. And then finally, uh, again, uh, I, I won't say um, the, the, the phrase is imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Um, I'll call it adoption is the sincerest form of flattery. And I've been gratified to see other versions of the LSDI now popping up. Uh, here's one out of uh, Korea. Uh, again, with a translation, here's one out of China, uh, having been translated into Chinese language. And here's a paper that recently was published uh, that I uh, was part of uh, and was put forward by Dr. Ito in Japan with a Japanese language version. And so far, the data from these countries has been very similar to what we found in our American cohort, that uh, the overall change for these patients is just not that substantial, uh, despite extensive fusions. So final thoughts, uh, stiffness impacts for pan lumbar fusion don't significantly worsen and don't really drive satisfaction. And that's true whether we use upper thoracic or thoracal lumbar junctional levels as our upper endpoint. Uh, and similarly, preservation of L5 S1 does not uh, reduce stiffness impact. So the functional benefit of maintaining one open segment at the bottom of the spine simply doesn't uh, uh, add that much in terms of activity. And I want to acknowledge all of my coworkers uh, and uh, particularly the International Spine Study Group, and most importantly, my family. Uh, and these are actually much, <laughs> these are very old photos. Uh, this is my son. He's now 18 years old and he's uh, three inches taller than me and uh, has a voice as deep as mine. So, in line with what, uh, what, um, what Jens was saying, I think it's a sign of seniority to see your children uh, become adults. So I'll, I'll end with that. And I, I guess I would extend it and say the same thing about residents and fellows. It's been one of the greatest uh, gratifications of my career to see uh, the surgeons that we've helped train go out and, um, and, and really become masters of their trade. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hart. Thank you for uh, introducing us to these interesting data, answering uh, this much debated topic on uh, the stiffness of the lumbar spine after surgery. Uh, I think it's been, uh, it was very, very enlightening. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And again, thanks so much for the invitation and thanks to Elias for arranging it. Thank you. Uh, with this, we move to our uh, last and special speaker, uh, Professor John Dupusset. Uh, when Professor Dupusset uh, first talked about the cone of energy and the, pul the pelvic vertebra, many young neurosurgeons like myself weren't even born. So I'm honored uh, to introduce you, Professor Dupusset. Uh, bon soirée, can you hear me? Good, <clears throat> Good evening to everybody. And of course, 
I uh, try to put my slide on, but I am not a good expert. And I want to thank first the organizing committee to give me the great honor to speak in front of you. So I don't know how to put uh, my uh, slide on. Uh, professor, if you go to the green arrow in the bottom. Green arrow, yes, yes. That should uh, do that. I did, and after, uh, I don't see my slide. <laughs> ah, this is good. And it is, we can see it. It, it is, yes. So, <clears throat> I was very happy to hear the first speaker because they have said almost everything I will show you. <laughs> the important for this topic is to not confuse alignment and balance. Uh, 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 and to, to, to go to alignment and balance. Because uh, in human standing, you must, you must mix alignment and balance. One is static and the other is dynamic. So on the X-ray, <clears throat> when you see uh, this patient, uh, the alignment is not so good, uh, but uh, what about balance? When you use the uh, EOS imaging system, you have the advantage. <clears throat> to see the patient not only front back, but you see also the horizontal plane. And it is very important to understand the importance of this horizontal plane. You see, when you see X-ray of this patient, not so bad, but uh, your eyes are ad 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 adapted to, to, to the instruments. But uh, when you see from the top and from the back and from the bottom, it is not exactly the same. And you see where the alignment is not so perfect. So to simplify, one of my fellow uh, uh, design the uh, vertebral vector that you see here on the 3D vertebral vector, uh, able to quantify. And you see the aspect of the normal spine of the right thoracic scoliosis pre and post-op. And uh, when you say, when you look to the same Lenke one group, uh, if you uh, 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 subtract, put, put them uh, in various uh, cases, uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, the lumbar modifier, the sagittal modifier described by Larry, but you need an horizontal uh, modifier. When you see this patient that was already treated with uh, interspinous uh, device uh, and uh, uh, that was treated by transpedicular osteotomy, this was done by my friend Jean-Marc Vital in Bordeaux. When you see the view from the top demonstrates the good alignment, uh, but the balance with me judge only when motion and function. We must get dynamic recording to get the mobility, stability. So you have the EOS imaging system, you have the force plate uh, uh, measurement, and you have the dynamic motion analysis to have this dynamic evaluation of the balance and function. Because uh, a balance uh, static uh, or dynamic is the stability within the movement. You have to take it of course, globally or lo locally, remembering that global and lo local are permanent, permanently linked, sometimes for worsening, sometimes for compensation. But think always that never treat one, ignoring the other. You have, you know very well, the complication cascades that can occur af after uh, only an herniated disc. And uh, uh, it is evident that the erect posture in human is characterized by three major elements. Uh, uh, the chain of balance with uh, cephalic vertebra and horizontal gaze. You have the, the, the very big importance of the pelvic vertebra that can uh, move and compensate, as you see, and this drive to the cone of economy, of course. That is a very important concept. Because the concept of the uh, cephalic vertebra, you know, the postlimenectomy and the swan neck deformity that you can get when you see this patient, 
that was a congenital myopathy. myopathy. She was obliged to hold his, his head uh, before the surgery of the spinal deformity uh, by the hand. After she was uh, aligned correctly, uh, you see the head was holding by itself. So the reverse pendu pendulum concept is uh, very important as well as the con concept of the uh, uh, vertebra, pelvic vertebra as a uh, 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 intercalary bone. The, the erect posture was acquired progressively during infancy and childhood, the result of harmonious bone and joint alignment during motion, thanks to neurological input, reflex, and acquired automatism was learned during infancy and childhood. It is the, the balance. It is the, uh, Ba ba balance. And uh, uh, if you think to this patient, this, this child uh, climbing the stair, you have the mechanical requirements, the chain of joint in the space must work. You have the muscle function, antagonist and agonist, strength, power, relaxation, modulation, speed, acceleration, braking, and the neurological requirement, of course. Vision, very important. ENT, proprioception, you have the modulation by coordination and double task with the cognition, that is a very important thing. And you have at the end of the composite uh, chain in the space, the effector uh, about speed transmission and, and reaction. So the global, the first uh, consequence is that the global balance is evidently neurological, proprioception, visual afference, and you, you, you see the tractography of the visual route when you see so many junctions inside the brain. And uh, of course, the vestibulo uh, labyrinthic efference. Uh, and here you see very well on these very nice drawings that uh, for me summarize uh, the integrative centers that are from brain level, mid brain level, cerebellum, spinal cord, and the effector system, the oculomotor system, with the stabilization for the body and the gaze. And the two second major conclusion is coming from the clinic that the disorder of this balance are often automatically correct by compensation. You have the compensation, very big characteristic of the human nature, biological, metabolic, and for example, orthopedic level, lumbar lordosis compensate, if flexion contracture, knee flexion, abduction of the shoulder compensate a, a, a pronation defect. And aging, uh, uh, you see that with aging, the pelvic retrogression come, but it is compensated by knee flexion, lumbar lordosis, and you see this drawing very uh, uh, clear, clearly uh, uh, demonstrated. And remember also that the loss of extension of the hip joint as a consequence, this was dem demonstrated clearly by Isvant Overka with the hip extension reserve. It is why from time to time, a total hip will resolve the problem of low back pain because it compensates a moderate loss of the lumbar lor lor lordosis. And this explains many immediate or secondary failures. For example, when you have a hip flexion contracture, of course, you have the change of the orientation of the pelvis. So remember, the hip extension reserve is important. Each person has a specific morphotype of the spine, and, it, and you, you, you know why uh, the incidence uh, Angle was described by Madame Duval Beaupère, and you, you know very well the four sagittal type of the spinal alignment in the population. Uh, uh, it is one of the factors of the chain of balance with this big uh, genetic penetrance that you can get. And remember that this is not always. Uh, 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 the incidence angle may change. And uh, you, you saw, we did an experience for 30 idiopathic scoliosis uh, uh, fused only on the thoracic area down to uh, 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 L1 or L2 ma ma maximum. And when we measure the posture and the movement after the fusion, we see that it was a change very important. Uh, and Go, going to 
showing that the compensation come uh, from the movement of the pelvic vertebra. And we saw in this uh, survey that 50% of the case had a modification of the pelvic angle incidence angle up to 11 degrees. So uh, 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 the, the, the real question of, of the balance is uh, uh, a question of the piling up of the body regarding the gravity axis, but mainly of the mass, the mass, not only of the angle. So because the head, thorax, abdomen, pelvis are mass and uh, the ignorance of the concept was uh, explaining uh, many of uh, uh, failure that you can get because you have a calculation only on the projected angle, not on the mass. And for example, this uh, uh, transpedicular os osteotomy uh, would uh, not so bad sagittal alignment, but you, you will know uh, the result on the balance, uh, uh, not immediately on the x-ray that you to show, but it is uh, uh, taking count uh, uh, the afference, uh, the integration, the effector below, in between, above. And uh, so uh, remember that it is necessary, and it was already said very clearly, uh, uh, and the last speaker demonstrated the importance of all uh, uh, the, the brain function uh, uh, to uh, to test the, the, the result. Long time ago, uh, in in two thousand uh, in two uh, uh, two thousand eleven, some similar like that in Miami, I describe the spine like a statue. It is this long instrumentation when you see here. And uh, uh, when you do that, uh, you have a very high risk. You have only motion at the cervicothoracic uh, uh, and at the hip junction. It is why in many cases you see this so-called PGK uh, and uh, uh, hip pelvic junction failure. And uh, uh, when you have uh, uh, this head, this for example, if in your plan you do too much lumbar lordosis, you remember, you, you see that your upper part of the, of the, of the spine is pulled on the back. And after to recover a, 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 a gravity line, it is necessary to have a, a, a PGK. So it is uh, due, to the uh, spinal imbalance of the head, of the mass of the head. So it, don't, don't be addicted by the angle. R think about mass, uh, uh, it is important. Upper jun junctional kyphosis, not a question of hook, screw, wire, ligament, connector, everything. It's a comprehension of the chain of balance, uh, uh, local balance of the cephalic ver ver vertebra. So, uh, why? Why is this occur? Uh, because the, the, the pre-op were, were done uh, purely static with ignorance of the amplitude uh, and uh, uh, to, to know exactly the possibility of compensation above and below the fusion zone. And when you ignore the mass of the head uh, and the thorax of the pelvis and the lower limb, you you, you, you are looking on, on the pure, pure projection of the alignment, but you don't know about the exact active possibility. So you need some, uh, to, 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 to measure this, uh, this dynamic, you have to make coupling of the uh, AOS imaging, uh, of the reconstruction of the, uh, of the me measurement of the force play to, to try to approach the, 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 the dynamic balance in the Spain, in the spy, in the space, and uh, to approach uh, this uh, cone of economy that I described lo long time ago. Because you see, uh, for example, for, 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 for this patient, you, you follow with time the patient, and it is very useful for uh, aging people. 
that with time you have a, a extension amplitude uh, uh, of, of the spine, very almost symmetrical to the amount of flexion. And slowly and slowly you keep flexion good, but you, you, you lose uh, amplitude of extension. And with the time you, you, you become unbalanced then critical then uh, overstep. So it is necessary to try if you follow this very clearly uh, uh, to, to, to choose the time to do surgery before, not only as a cardio pulmonary, uh, et cetera, function uh, 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 disappear, but uh, also to, to, to try to, to do the surgery before too much correction. It is why it is necessary to measure, this was already said by previous speaker, but I, I will emphasize this, to measure the, 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 the in standing as well in lying position, the active movement, uh, 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 total ex, uh, segmental uh, head, cervical spine, spine, and also at the same, same level, same thing, hip joint, to keep the possibility of adaptation and compensation. So prevention, for, for me, four factors, very important. Never stop the, the uh, upper uh, instrumentation or the junctional vertebra, because the junctional vertebra is always the most instable. Uh, and you shave the, you check the active posture band bending, head, upper thoracic spine, including the scapular girdle with uh, uh, humeral heads. You check the lumbar thoracolumbar. Uh, if you, you, in your plan, you, 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 the lumbar spine is not be plain, not be plain to, to be fused you must check the active lumbar lordosis of the patient. And if you have to fuse down to uh, uh, the, the sacrum, you must check also uh, uh, the amount of lordosis and then the, the incidence angle of some importance, but never forgot the hip extension reserve that is uh, as important in passive or in, in active. And this is, it's easy and, and uh, uh, when you have a, a research lab, when you have all the tools, but you don't have this in, in, your, in your clinic uh, easily. So for me, it's an important thing to check uh, uh, the patient with a simple chron chronometer. Uh, you can do this in, in your clinic. Speed and walking five meters straight forward backwards. Speed and ease to climb three stairs and go down. And for me, the most discriminant is the speed and ease to squat on the floor and get up. But never forgot to make this uh, uh, very easy uh, testing is to walking we, while you are speaking on the telephone or for example, uh, you spin one, two, three, or you, you, you spin uh, 90, uh, 90 uh, one with one, uh, with two, with three, uh, uh, everything. And you have the double task that give you an idea of the condition of the, of, of the patient. So never forgot this. So for me, uh, you, you must check your, your planning. At is was said, uh, uh, even for the post-operative evaluation, not only on static picture on X-ray, but on the dynamic measurement. For me, the dynamic balance in the space is a key for the longevity of the spinal unit remaining. And you remember that I, I did this drawing for the CD instrumentation in 1983. Uh, I want that, uh, uh, I, I demonstrate on the sagittal plane here, but you have to, to think that is occurring in the three dimension uh, uh, to get the, uh, the balance, uh, the unbalance in one direction or in other one. 
So you must uh, have the, the, the bone engine status, alignment mobility, the muscle power, and this is important, and uh, the coordination with the neural system, neurological system with the vision vestibular, proprioception, coordination, and the efferent. And uh, uh, you have to, to check this uh, to every of your patient becoming slowly and slowly old, uh, as soon as 45 year old. And uh, then to prevent this, uh, you can have uh, proper nutrition, of course. If you have to do surgery at that time, is necessary, of course, to do. You make the correction of the various levels as you have. Uh, uh, you must uh, have daily physical exercise sufficient in time and, and intensity, not performance, but exercise. And uh, uh, you have, uh, of course, uh, to have your control and correct vision and uh, especially good, good foot, uh, uh, shoes, and physical ex ex exercise. We in two direction, proprioception and vestibular. And ne never forget the cognitive rehabilitation with double task. And of course, be very careful. And this was said all, all also by Jens uh, at, at, at the begin at the first talk. Be careful with the medical drugs, of course, that change this. And uh, Aging uh, uh, does uh, exercise has some influence on the result. And you must remember this work uh, in 2013 for uh, a big number of patients uh, with a mean age 76 year old people. Uh, half were doing uh, uh, daily exercise, balance, tai chi. And uh, the other half was not doing such exercise. And in the, in the case that were exercise group, 40% less fall and 61% less fracture in the exercise group. And we did a, a meeting at the a, a National Academy of Medicine about the muscles in uh, uh, January 2000. And we demonstrate here clearly that the satellite cells are able to activate and multiply in the muscle. Uh, of course, when you are very young, you have 45, 65 division at five year old. And, but you are still at 15. You are still at 31 year. But even at 80 year old, even 86 year old, you have still division demonstrating that, uh, of course, exercise is very Im important. So don't mix, don't, don't uh, 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 remember that you, you, you have not to, uh, to, to, to speak about balance uh, when you say an X-ray. Uh, alignment and balance are very, very important things. They are not uh, uh, opposed, they are complementary. A good alignment is preferable to have a good balance, but not sufficient. It needs a 3D balance. Of course, just in 3D with uh, the polygon of support, uh, with the entire chain of balance, but also needs compensation, passive and active, and big needs the, the reaction, action reaction, on the neurological uh, point of view. This is the uh, result of, of the balance. And uh, 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 remember that with uh, Jean-Pierre Farcy, a <laughs> long time ago, we, uh, we say that aging starts on your birthday and a good health for elderly is prepared during childhood and afterward. So, you have so many things that uh, entering on the balance, mechanics, hearing, vision, emotion, vestibule, proprioception, thalamus, hormone, and bone and nerve function. So it is only 
the, 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 the message that don't mix alignment and balance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor de Pousset, uh, for this enlightening talk. Now, we can only cover so much in a 90 minutes webinar, but I think we touched base on general view uh, of the Sagittarius alignment with Professor de Pousset and Dr. Chapman. Uh, Dr. Barry uh, reviewed with us the main tools a spine surgeon has to correct the spinal alignment. And Dr. Hart introduced us to uh, one of the new outcome measures uh, in uh, sagittal deformity surgery. To add an element of discussion to this webinar, I asked my uh, colleagues and friends, uh, Dr. Baasiri and Dr. Elias, to present a short case each, uh, which I would like to hear, uh, which is I'm going to open for discussion for all the panelists. Uh, so I'm going to ask Wasim first to present his case. And doctors, please uh, feel free to join in with your uh, comments afterward. Uh, Wasim, the screen is yours. Thank you, Khaled, for, for this uh, great organization. Uh, so today I will be presenting one of uh, Professor Barre's uh, feedback surgery uh, cases. So this is a 37-year-old man with uh, known to have Sherman kyphosis, otherwise negative past medical history. Uh, he, he has a high-grade lumbar spondylitis disease that was operated in 2006 in another uh, center. Uh, he had a posterior fixation with radical screws between L4 and S1. The fixation was done in situ without any uh, reduction. And he had a uh, posterior lumbar body diffusion at the level of L5 uh, S1. He had good surgical outcome and symptom relief uh, until 2018, where he started to complain of recurrent pain. Mainly, um, he uh, represented to our uh, clinics in February 2020 with significant low back pain with bilateral lower extremity uh, radiation that required daily oral morphine intake. And he uh, required a cane for ambulation. And he had a very limited walking distance estimated at 100 meters. On the neurological exam, he had a right lower extremity deficit um, at three over five and at the left uh, lower extremity at four over five. He had an EVA score that was elevated at eight over 10, Eiffel score at 19, and also state disability index at mm -hmm. 31. So here we can see um, the, uh, the radio images uh, for this patient. Here we can see the fixation that was done involving L4, L5 and S1 screws with the, uh, with the P-lift that was done, showing a very uh, significant lumbosacral uh, kyphosis and uh, a rigid deformity, rigid and fixed deformity. Here we can also see a posterior um, defect due to the uh, laminectomy that was done. Here is the scan done in July 2019, showing the, uh, showing the same uh, fixation. Here we can appreciate the cages that were uh, inserted. And here we can see uh, the significant rigidity at the uh, L5 S1 uh, area. Here we can appreciate the Sherman uh, kyphosis on the, the, the thoracic spine. And here is the MRI done in August 2019, showing a mild uh, L4 uh, canal stenosis with no significant stenosis at the level uh, of the sacrum. Here we can appreciate multiple disc degeneration also the same in the uh, thoracic, uh, thoracic spine. So this is the AS that was done in February 2020, showing significant sagittal equilibrium. The patient had a very high SVA, measuring at 13.5 centimeters, and a retroverted pelvis uh, with a pelvic incidence of 75.6, a pelvic tilt at 34.9, and the interesting issue here is the L4 uh, S1 uh, very limited, uh, very low lordosis, which leads to a very high PI uh, yeah. lumbar lordosis mismatch. Here, uh, showing the um, uh, showing uh, the Schwab classification, this patient fits into the very high deformity category in all these uh, parameters. So, as a case summary, this is a 37-year-old man. He had a L4 S1 fixation for high grade spondylo, presenting with severe low back pain, recurrent with radiculopathy, a lumbosacral kyphosis with retroverted pelvis, and a very decompensated sagittal balance, and with a very low L4 S1 lordosis. So, 
I will leave this maybe for the discussion uh, after afterwards. So what we did is actually in February 20, 2021, uh, bilateral um, S1 pedicle subtraction osteotomy uh, with L2 to L5 pedicle screw uh, fixation, along with the insertion of uh, bilateral index screws and a sublaminar uh, band. Here we can really appreciate the uh, osteotomy that was done at the level uh, of S1. Here is the interesting part, comparing the pre-op and the post-op parameters, showing significant improvement in the uh, SVA with a reduction of almost uh, four uh, centimeters from 13.5 to 9.5 centimeters, and a correction of the uh, pelvic um, uh, retroversion with significant lowering of the pelvic incidence and the uh, uh, pelvic uh, tilt. Here we can also mark that the patient had, uh, had um, uh, improved uh, concerning his um, L4 S1 uh, lordosis, uh, gaining almost 11, uh, 11 uh, degrees. And significantly also the pelvic incidence lumbar lordosis mismatch has been significantly uh, improved. Here we can see the patient in pre-op having to flex his hips as a compensatory mechanism. And the post-op, the patient is standing more in an upright uh, position without having to decompensate. So clinically, the patient was able to walk with, a, with his brace uh, uh, post-operatively with mild help. And he reported significant decrease in his bilateral lower extremity uh, pain. He had no neurological uh, complications. And also we had no uh, complications concerning uh, other uh, parameters, neither bleeding or infection. So a quick note on the technique of the sacral uh, particle subtraction osteotomy, which is a very technically demanding uh, technique and associated with, with very high risks. Uh, the osteotomy extends uh, from, the, uh, from the dorsal S1 foramen up to the uh, top of the uh, sacral ala, including the anterior cortex of the uh, sacrum. The surgeon has to have a very, uh, very good knowledge of the anatomy, or else there, there is a very high risk of vascular, mainly, uh, mainly the internal iliac artery and vein, vascular injury, and he has to have very good knowledge of the L5 and the S1 nerve root uh, uh, position. So, what are the main indications for uh, sacral uh, pedicle uh, subtraction osteotomy? Mainly, uh, like in our patient, if the patient has a fixed high-grade uh, L5 uh, S1 spondylolisthesis, and if he has a very severe uh, sagittal imbalance with the deformity mainly below uh, L4. Other uh, indications are kyphotic deformity secondary to sacral uh, fractures, and in patients where we have a very high uh, lordosis, more than 90 degrees, which overwhelms the ability of the number of osteotomy to further correct the uh, lordosis, and in patients with very high pelvic incidence, more than 90, which was in our patient uh, uh, almost 70, 70, uh, 73 degrees. I would like to thank you, and we'll uh, keep the uh, floor open for discussions with uh, Professor Barry uh, concerning this case. Uh, Wasim, I have a question. Do you always simulate uh, your cases uh, before operating on them? Always the cases are discussed with the Professor Barry. The angles are measured using the, uh, using the uh, special softwares. And uh, according to the uh, angles, the osteotomy is studied and uh, the location and the extent of the osteotomy is, uh, is decided. Yes, I, I can do a, a comment on the on the case. Thank you, Wasim, for the nice presentation. So um, I would say that it, it's a difficult case because it's a rigid, uh, kyphotic deformity in the lumbosacral zone. So normally you have a much uh, of the lordosis between L4 and S1, and in this case there is a, a important and completely uh, rigid and fused kyphotic uh, L4 sacrum segment. So the only way to correct the deformity is to go uh, with that kind of osteotomy. So you have to go uh, to a sacral osteotomy is the only way to correct the deformity. There is no 
other relevant options. So of course, it's a very technical, uh, difficult surgery. You have to understand perfectly the anatomy. Um, Wasim uh, show us the, the risk entirely to the to the sacrum that there is you, you need to protect regarding the vessels, nerve root, and so on. But at the end, it's feasible and it's um, it's um, surgery that could very be helpful for that kind of deformity. Thank you, Dr. Scafield. Yes. Yes, uh, we're seeing very nice case. Uh, how, what do you do to protect the vessels and how do you do it? Do you do it before you do the osteotomy or at the end of your osteotomy? So, um, in fact, the, the, the risk is uh, when you separate the S1 vertebral body uh, with the sacral ala. So you need yes. to, uh, after the classical osteotomy, you need then to separate uh, the, the vertebral body of S1 to the sacral area. So you need to drill. So I, I use two tricks uh, to protect the vessels. First, I, I dissect uh, the superior border of the sacral area and I push some hemostatic uh, uh, product to, to push entirely the vessels. And also I drill, I, I don't use osteotome, I, I use a drill, diamond, diamond drill, to, uh, to resect the bone and uh, be uh, safe regarding the, the soft tissue anteriorly. Yeah, this is what I meant. You... Yeah, this is what I meant. I mean, you use the diamond drill, not the osteotope. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right. And, and one more question. I congratulate uh, the presenter for this case. Uh, very well done, but uh, as you show, very difficult. And this, uh, it's uh, for me, the importance of the correction of the lombosacral kyphosis is the high grade sp sp spondylo. And uh, 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 if, you, if you reduce the, the, the kyphosis, not completely, but if you if you re reduce sufficiently to have a, a good alignment af after, not so bad. Uh, this will prevent to 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 have such difficult case to do when you do inside of fusion of such a problem because it is only a question of kyphosis and not slippage. Well, thank you, doctors, for your comments. Uh, in the interest of time, we move to the final section of this webinar uh, from Seattle with Dr. Elias presenting uh, his case for discussion. Uh, Elias, the screen is yours. Thank you, Khalid. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I want to say hello to my big boss, Dr. Skaf in Lebanon. So I will uh, present a case that I did with uh, Dr. Chapman. So this is a case of a 53-year-old male, uh, HIV positive. He presented with uh, symptoms of uh, low back pain, right lower extremity weakness, and tickling sensation. Uh, he reported that his uh, right lower extremity occasionally gives out on him, which causes him to fall down. His symptoms were aggravated mainly by walking, standing, and bending down. He tried uh, mul multiple uh, conservative therapies, including medication, bracing, injection, and physiotherapy, but he had no relief. So uh, on exam, he had diffuse uh, right lower extremity weakness. It was associated with uh, decreased uh, sensation and a positive right uh, straight leg raise. So this is his uh, pre-op uh, CT scan. And as you can see here, he has some uh, uh, left uh, convexity curve around 18 to 20 degrees, if we reference it from L1 to L5. He had also uh, end-stage collapse, mainly over the L3-4 with a large osteophyte formation and multi-level degeneration. Uh, regarding his uh, scoliosis x-ray, he had some uh, dextroscoliosis, mainly over the upper thoracic area 
again, around 18 to 20 degrees levoscoliosis between L1 to L5, and multilevel uh, lateral listesis right and left from L2 to L5. So his, uh, his pre-op MRI showed, uh, again, multilevel stenosis, mainly from L1 to L5. The most severe one was over the L3, L4 area over here. And uh, he had uh, multiple multilevel degeneration with foramen stenosis, as I mentioned before. So we elected to take this patient to surgery, to do a two-stage surgery, the first one, uh, to do uh, the first one was to do a uh, uh, XLIF, uh, which will be followed by a posterior approach. So for the XLIF, I'm sorry for the screen. Okay, so so for the XLIF, uh, we went uh, from the left side, which is the convex side, and we did L2 to L5 uh, cage insertions. As you can see here, uh, those are the XLIF cages on the right side of the screen. This is the post-op uh, CT scan showing the cage insertion after the XLIF. Then the, uh, the next day we took the patient and we did a posterior approach. Uh, so we did a posterior approach, instrumental fusion, mainly from T10 to the pelvis. Uh, we did a posterior three column osteotomy over the L1, L2 area. We inserted uh, two rise cages over L1, L2, and we inserted two rise cages over L5, S1. So those are the post-op uh, X-ray scan. As you can see, we did not get a good coronal correction. We, we got a good uh, sagittal uh, correction, but the coronal cor correction was not enough. This is the post-op CT scan. And you can see again, those are the rise cages and the XLIF cages. And on the left side, you can see the coronal deformity that was not properly corrected. So on follow-up, directly post-op, the patient reported that his uh, right leg pain improved significantly, and he didn't report any more uh, right-sided symptoms, and he, he, he denied the, the sensory deficit that he had before the surgery. However, uh, three months post-op, uh, he started complaining of, again, low back pain and severe left leg pain. He stated that his posture was uh, tilting more and more towards the right side. And this is an X-ray three months after his initial surgery. And as you can see, he has increased in the degrees of his levoscoliosis. So after discussing the case again with the patient, we elected to take him to OR in order to recorrect his uh, coronal imbalance. This time, uh, we elected to extend the instrumentation all the way up to T4. And uh, we inserted double, screw, double iliac screws. We used TP hooks over the T4 area with wires. And as you can see here, we removed uh, the previous bilateral rise cages over L1, L2, and we did a partial asymmetric PSO over the right side of L1, L2, and we inserted a peak cage from the right side. So we ended up with this construct. This is T4 to pelvis quadrat with, again, a good correction, sagittal correction, and uh, mainly fair enough correction over of uh, the coronal deformity. This is the CT scan of the patient post-op. So you can appreciate over the right side his sagittal or his, uh, his sagittal correction and his coronal correction over the right side. So uh, we followed up on this patient. So this is a comparative, those are comparative x-rays. This is the initial one post up in February. This is his deteriorating state in May. And this is, this was his, uh, Scully X-ray uh, in October. 
Then we followed up again on him in December, and we noted that the patient is tilting again over the right side. So his thoracic curvature was around 12 degrees in October. However, unfortunately, it increased to uh, around 38 or 40 degrees in December. Uh, so before I open, before I leave uh, this uh, PowerPoint for discussion, I wanna mention that I think that uh, this, uh, this mild correction is iatrogenic. One of the risk, one of the mistakes that we did was the insertion of the extif cages from the convex side uh, of, of the lumbar area instead of doing it from the concave side. And another uh, mistake that we did is that we placed bilateral uh, rise cages over the L1, L2 area instead of only inserting maybe one cage from the right side, from the concave side, and compressing the opposite side. So the question now is for the panelists, Dr. Dubossé, Barré, Dr. Hart, Dr. Scaff. So what, what should we do next? And should we wait, should we revise? Do you think there are other mistakes that were done? And thank you. Yeah, thank you, Elias. Uh, we have also a question from the audience. Dr. Sultan is saying maybe we could have gotten away with a a um, minimal invasive L3, L4 to address the radiculopathy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be the devil advocate and say sometimes more is less. So what do you think? Doc, I will leave, I will leave the, the comment for the other panelists. Yes. I, I will say my opinion. Yes. Dr. Yeah. Did you, see, did you see any bony fusion when, when the surgery was revised? So uh, this is a good question because mainly over the lower lumbar area, we didn't. We noted that he had some non-union, and he had left iliac uh, screw fracture. Uh, was he a smoker? Uh, I'm not sure. I, he's. I think he's an ex-smoker. I'm not sure if he's still an active smoker. <laughs> So what do you think, Dr. Scott? Well, I think like you said, I mean, you started with the problem uh, of the cages that were uh, wrongly inserted or they were misplaced. They were placed on the, on the left side where they were supposed to be, to be placed on the right side. But I would, uh, I would have probably looked into some uh, uh, bony fusion, a better quality of bone uh, to fuse this patient, uh, maybe uh, before I extend this uh, instrumentation further up, uh, to see a to do a limited a limited surgery before we go that much up, because this he's going to fail all the way. Okay, Doctor Hart, do you have any comment? Well, it's, it, it's a difficult case. I'm, I'm struck a little bit uh, by the tilting that's going on after the second uh, surgery, the revision, because he, he certainly looked nicely aligned mm -hmm. after that. And it begins to make me wonder whether there's something neurologic going on with him that's leading to this. Uh, um, certainly the first case, you know, wasn't quite as nicely aligned as we'd have wanted, but... Um, um, you know, the, the second one certainly looked well done to me and I would have expected a nice outcome. And so I don't think I would revise him yet. Uh, and if he hasn't seen neurology, I would definitely arrange that consult. Okay. Um, and uh, beyond that, I'm not certain. I, I will mention the the way that we judge the alignment interoperatively now and for many years has been with this T-bar that we balance a transverse bar over the sacrum and then you and there's a vertical uh, bar that goes all the way to the top of the rib cage and we then use a just a fluoroscopic assessment on the table to make sure that we've got the coronal alignment we're looking for yeah. uh, and there's you know all kinds of techniques uh, and we've talked about those but derotation is probably the first but then inside to bending uh, becomes that another and compression and distraction uh, as appropriate becomes another. So interoperatively looking for it and taking the steps you need to do to get what you what you need. And I guess the last would be bony resection, right? If you have to 
take bone on the on the con convex side in order to shorten it, uh, you, you need to go ahead and do that. Yeah. So, Dr. Barry and Dr. Jumbo said, do you have any any comments? <clears throat> For me, uh, uh, you 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 say at the beginning it is. Uh, uh, Ten degree scoliosis. It's not a scoliosis for me. This, this for me, it's a degenerative spine. And uh, when you start at the beginning uh, on the uh, convexity, uh, at, at that moment you destabilize it a little bit more. So now uh, I think that uh, that is was proposed. Uh, to remove uh, everything, uh, to uh, to to put uh, during the surgery in traction, in order to to level correctly the pelvis and to fuse uh, to the pelvis according to this uh, this thing. I, I don't know if, if in the adult if you use so much the the, the traction peroperative traction that allow to make axis of the in 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 the in the sagittal as well as in in the in the frontal plane but uh, i don't know what what uh, uh, adult uh, surgeon uh, say you, you call this always uh, it is a, a scoliosis no for me it's not a scoliosis it's only a degenerative spine degenerative spine and that at the beginning at the first thing you destabilize completely uh, and of course of course but this was said probably this patient has some Neurological problem uh, about uh, I don't know what is it is the brain it is the cerebellum it is uh, the, sp the, the the spinal cord uh, I think there is something wrong on this uh, status. Okay, thank you, and uh, Dr. Barry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry I missed a part of the presentation because. Uh, uh, I have a problem with my connection. So I will do just a general comment. Uh, I agree with Professor Dubousset. I will suspect for this patient a neurological degenerative disease. And one other point is the importance of coronal plane. Because the last year, we, uh, we were focused on the sagittal plane, sagittal alignment, uh, and... Uh, now we we take care about the, the coronal plane so uh, and we know that the disability uh, with coronal imbalance can can be as important as with uh, sagittal disorder so sagittal plane is important but also coronal plane also thank you uh, okay. uh, dr anita from the audience asking are there any loosening of the screws in the last case so uh, again so uh, yeah, so uh, so we had breakage of the left iliac uh, screw. Mm -hmm. If you can see the May the May uh, X-ray, so when we revised, we found that the left iliac was uh, was broken. Mm -hmm. And and as Dr. Scaff said, we didn't have a proper union over here. And uh, what do you plan to do with this patient? What is your actual plan? I don't know yet. That's why we're presenting it now <laughs> to get to get opinions. Doctor Basi, do you have anything or any input on it? Can't really add much to, but uh, I cannot add much more with with this uh, with this speaker. So not really. But maybe if you have uh, have done uh, with a, with a with a mild approach initially, that would might have ev evaded uh, to having uh, this uh, big problem. Yes. Yes. I think you should send the, send this patient to your enemy. To my to my what? Your enemy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Khaled, do you want to take it from here, or Doctor Scott? Yeah, um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, all of the participants uh, 
to this web webinar. Uh, thank you, Professor Jean de Bousset. Thank you, Professor Cedric Barret, Professor Jens uh, Chapman, and Professor Robert Hart. Um, thank, uh, a big thank to our boys, the AUB alumni, Dr. Wasim Basiri, and Dr. Leslie, and also to our moderator, uh, our chief resident, Dr. Khaled uh, Lauk. Um, I think this was not just another uh, scientific task, as it's proven by the quality of the presentation uh, given uh, by the esteemed faculty, also by the number of participants and the high quality of discussions that have uh, further enlightened all of us and have accelerated the exchange of ideas with a scaling up of successful practices, I think. I am confident that uh, with this novel partnership and ongoing collaboration with the European Association of Neurosurgical Societies, EANS, we will continue to further discover the remaining we, uh, unknowns or unknown secrets of the spine and serve spine surgery in the future. Um, heartiest congratulations to all of the participants and special congratulations to the hard work of Dr. Khaled al who successfully put this uh, webinar together with Dr. Basir and Dr. Lies Lies. Finally, uh, I'm really, today, I'm really a proud spine surgeon as I watch and listen to my boys, the young spine surgeons. Thank you all, and I look forward to see in a, uh, in a future seminar in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Skaff, for your kind words. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for all the speakers and everyone who tuned in today. I remind you that the recording of this present of this webinar will be available on the EANS website. And my apologies for any questions that we couldn't answer. We will make sure to forward them uh, later on to you. Thank you so much. I wish you all a good day and a good evening. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.